It is therefore now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Agriculture. The new chair of the Ontario Processing and Vegetable Growers is pretty well known around this building. She is the old chief of staff to the former Minister of Agriculture, a relative of a former Liberal MPP, and a well-connected Liberal lobbyist. The same old, same old Liberal patronage. And it looks like Liberal entitlement at its finest. It does not send a good message to Ontario farmers. Mr. Speaker, was the chair appointed because of her Liberal connections? And Mr. Speaker, was it the Premier's office that drove this, that drove this patronage appointment? Can you see it, please? Can you see it, please? Thank you. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Mr. Speaker, simple answer, no. How is Garfield on that? Okay. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, it seems the Liberals don't want to reconcile their patronage and Liberal entitlement, so I'll try a different question on behalf of Ontario farmers. In over 14 years, Ontario farmers have seen broken promises after broken promises, and one of the best examples of that is the natural gas expansion. They've been waiting and waiting, and that promise keeps on coming, and frankly, the funding for it seems to be diminished year after year. So a very direct question to the Minister of Agriculture, will we actually see this natural gas expansion at the amount funded finally honoured this year? Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Municipal Affairs, come to order. And the Minister of Indigenous Relations come to order. You're not going to get the last word. Minister? Thank you very much. Uh... Member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, come to order. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, to the Minister of Infrastructure, who's been a real leader on this file. Thank you. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. While it is appropriate to move to another minister, it's not appropriate to add anything else. Thank you. <laughs> minister of Infrastructure. When we announced the $100 million natural gas grant program, we became the first government in Ontario's history to make a significant investment in rural natural gas expansion. The program was a direct response to what we heard from Ontarians, that residents, farmers and small businesses want to reduce their energy costs. Our government believes that the expansion of natural gas access, particularly in rural and remote communities, is an absolute priority. We are expanding Niagara, natural gas order. access in underserved communities, including those in rural and northern Ontario. The expansion will help families, farmers, and small businesses save up to $1,500 in heating costs in each year, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, this $100 million Answer. program is leveraging millions more of investments from the gas utilities. In light of significant uptake for this program, we are working Thank hard you. to win the federal. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Agriculture, now the natural gas expansion is contingent on the federal government. They know how to make up any excuse to not honour their promises. You know, Mr. Speaker, let me ask a, a more local question on behalf of farmers in Simcoe County. The sheep farmers in Simcoe County have been dealing with an increase in predatory animals, particularly coyotes. They are a persistent threat. The Ontario Wildlife and Damage Compensation Program is supposed to be there to assist them. But there are serious concerns about the implementation of this program. Farmers are not getting the assistance they need and were promised by this government. Right. Mr. Speaker, can I get a commitment? Since I can't get a, a commitment on walking away from their patronage or a natural Farming. gas. Minister of can Economic Development, come to order. That on this program, the Liberals will ensure the Ontario Wildlife Damage Compensation Program will actually Question. give farmers the help they were promised. In case the in case the minister missed it, the, the minister of economic development come to order. Minister of infrastructure. Minister of agriculture. Minister of agriculture. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and indeed uh, the compensation uh, program 
uh, that we have in the province of Ontario is very important to our, our farming community. Uh, we have uh, trained staff that actually uh, uh, go to the field uh, to assess the damage that's been done by a predator. In fact, Mr. Speaker, uh, not too long ago, I took the opportunity to be Member at a farm Harrah, Bruce, in my riding in Peterborough uh, to see a sheep that was uh, attacked uh, by a fisher. Uh, to see that the damage that was done uh, by that particular predator. Uh, I know in that particular case, uh, the assessor uh, that would, comes from the municipality, in that case, Asheville Norwood, uh, goes in the field, assesses the damage, and uh, to make sure uh, that the farm community is adequately compensated. From time to time, we continue to monitor the situation to make sure that any farm yes, animal that's been damaged by a predator, you get compensated. Member from Prince Edward Hastings, come to order. Uh, and because this is happening, we're about inching away from warnings. If you would like to do that, we will. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the President of the Treasury Board. As the days go by, so does the government abuse of government-funded advertising. And frankly, Mr. Speaker, they, they not only have abused it, they have more than doubled the government ad buy for this year. It's one thing to use Liberal Party funds to campaign. It's another thing to use taxpayer dollars. So, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker my question is very direct to the President of the Treasury Board. Will they cancel the 5.5? Stop the clock. Stop the clock. We're in warnings. We are in warnings. And if I sit down and it starts, I might name. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, clearly the Auditor General has said these are partisan ads that would not have been approved by her office. Here, here. The question is, this latest $5.5 million ad buy, will you do the right thing and cancel these partisan ads? Here, here. <laughs> Well, th thank you very much, Speaker. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about the process for, for government advertising because there actually is a, uh, a bulk media buy uh, which is consolidated at my ministry. However, the process for approval is a ministry approaches cabinet office. Cabinet office makes a maximum allocation. Treasury board actually isn't party to that, uh, but uh, the figure that uh, presumably the uh, member is citing the, is the the maximum allowable edge uh, allocation. Uh, in order for the uh, ads to ever go to air, they have to be approved according to the Government Advertising Act. And I would, I would, uh, I would uh, point out to people that we continue to be the only jurisdiction in Canada that has a government advertising. Supplementary. Act. Well, Mr. Speaker, again to the minister, 5.5 million dollars may seem like nothing to a government. That wastes billions, but these millions, these millions could have been spent on much more worthy purposes, helping people with a hydro bill, uh, helping children who need services for autism. There are so many better uses than using taxpayer dollars to fund government advertising, to fund partisan ads. And so, let me ask this very direct question: Does the Treasury Board President believe it's appropriate to use taxpayer dollars? for liberal propaganda, because that's exactly what they're doing. Are you on the side of taxpayers, or are, are you going to continue to ignore the Auditor General? Do the right thing. Cancel these partisan ads. Do the right thing. Make sure it's not charged to the taxpayers. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. President? Well, I obviously— Excuse me. I obviously don't agree that the advertising that we've supported over the years is partisan ad. Think of some of the advertising that we have done as a government. Think of the Who Will You Help campaign uh, about sexual violence. And uh, if you go to that particular advertising campaign, the video was viewed internationally. The video was viewed by over 7 million uh, people in the first 10 days alone. 
alone eventually generated more than 85 million views worldwide. But what's really interesting about that ad is that it actually changed public opinion. And what we set out to do with that was to change Answer. the attitude towards sexual violence. And in fact, that ad achieved that. We don't think that's partisan. We think that's good social Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, my question is again to the minister. I'm talking about a $5.5 million hydro ad buy. Yep. And you know, the Auditor General, you, you say they're not partisan. The Auditor General, the nonpartisan legislative oversight, has said they are partisan. They would not have passed her office's approval, but you took that approval away. Yep. So rather than try to distract the public with a different ad campaign, be very clear. We're talking about these partisan hydro ads. Let me give you an example of something that would have been more of a worthy cause. The member for Nepean Carlton challenged the minister today that we could have used those funds on an opioid awareness. This is a real challenge. This is a real crisis. So will you accept the challenge from— Stop, stop. The member from Etobicoke North is warned. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, will the minister accept the challenge from the member from Nepean and Carleton do the right thing rather than have these partisan liberal propaganda ads on hydro? Question. Will you use those funds for an opioid awareness campaign? Thank you. Minister? Well, Speaker, we use government funding for a Stop clock. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs is warned. Carry on. We do advertising for a variety of reasons, including extensive health exam uh, things. Think about the uh, campaigns about getting a flu shot. Think about the campaigns uh, about Healthy Kids Community Challenge and quitting smoking. So yes, we do advertising about health, but we do advertising about a variety of things. Think about the climate change ads that we did, because unlike the people opposite. We actually think that climate change is one of the most serious problems facing us today as citizens of not just Ontario but citizens of the world. And the, uh, that, that, uh, that ad campaign again helped inform the public about the fact that climate change is real. It's not Thank a you. myth. The member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. New question. The member from Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My uh, question is for the Yesterday, Vice Premier. My leader, Andrew Horvat, told this House that over the weekend, 22 sick people in my hometown of Sudbury received their medical treatment in hospital hallway, TV room, patient lounge, and a shower room. This isn't the first time that the Deputy Premier and her Liberal government have been alerted to the overcrowding crisis in Ontario hospitals. What is the Deputy Premier's plan to fix the crisis in Sudbury? The Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, our plan uh, is to continue to invest in health care as we announced and are now implementing as a result of the spring budget. A $1 billion investment in the health care budget this year, Mr. Speaker. We're investing $7 billion new dollars in health care over the course of the next three years and $500 million specifically this year to hospitals on top of an equal amount last year. So we're investing in our hospitals, ensuring that they have the operating funds necessary to run their uh, institutions properly and provide that high-quality care. But we're also investing specifically in those hospitals that are facing capacity challenges. Uh, we're working uh, with those hospitals that are coming forward with proposals with regards to how we can further uh, make available beds for them uh, to—, to uh, to improve the process through which people who require admission are admitted into hospital. Mr. Thank Speaker. you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The minister knows that the Brampton Civic Hospital has been officially at overcapacity every single month of 2017. He also knows that this crisis did not start in 2017. The hospital has been at overcapacity 
for more than two long years. Since the minister has known about this crisis for years now, what is his plan to fix the mess at Brenton Civic Hospital? Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the member opposite's uh, figures are simply not true. Well, Mr. Speaker, so I have in front of me the hospital occupancy rates for every single hospital across this province, and I have the because they're delivered quarterly, uh, Mr. Speaker. Although we do track them on a daily basis, but the uh, most recent quarter from April through July of 2017, uh, Brampton uh, Hospital is uh, at 86 percent capacity. So, Mr. Speaker, it's important that we all in this legislature work with the facts. I'm happy to provide her with, as I have, and in fact, these are often generally publicly available very soon after I receive them myself. Uh, we're happy to actually Answer. work together uh, for those hospitals that are uh, facing specific capacity challenges, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the budget shortchanged Ontario Hospital by three hundred million dollars and the minister knows that he knows that because the Ontario Hospital Association has written has taken the step to write to the minister to tell him just so they've demanded immediate funding in order to avoid an even more acute crisis when the flu season which is just around the corner will hit us this winter how much funding can hospital accept expect from this government and when can they expect it to deal with the overcrowding crisis? Thank you. Minister. Well, you know, I know what's happening here, Mr. Speaker, because despite the NDP voting against our budget that included $24 million specifically to address capacity in hospitals, and despite the NDP seemingly being absolutely opposed to the Humber River proposal, the Finch site to, to add more than 150 beds for transitional patients that do not alone, who no longer need to be in hospital now they're going to they're trying to set themselves up as somehow this is their idea and an investment that we made long ago and work that we're currently doing with their hospitals to address not only capacity but the potential for surge due to the flu season which is upcoming we've been working with this intimately with the OHA with the hospital system will continue to work and it has nothing to do with Not quite sure. Wrap up sentence, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. Member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question is Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is again for the Vice Premier. In January this year, Humber River Hospital in Toronto was forced to admit 94 sick patients in unconventional bed. In February, it went up to 97 sick patients. In March, 61 sick patients. And in April, 68 sick patients were admitted in unconventional bed. That's 320 sick people forced to receive medical treatment in a public hallway with no privacy and no dignity. And that's just one hospital speaker. When will the minister at least tell us what is his plan to make sure that the sick patient admitted to Humber River Hospital will actually get a hospital room? Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Our plan, Mr. Speaker, is the one that they oppose. Our plan yeah. is to create at least in excess, at least we're considering a proposal from Humber River Hospital and, and, and a significant number of other hospitals in the, in the GTA. They've come forward with a proposal to address precisely what that party is asking us to do. So their proposal is in excess of 150 beds opening up for ALC patients in those hospitals, including Humber River, that know they're not acute. They no longer Longer need to be in that hospital environment. So the plan from Humber River Hospital is to actually bring those people into an appropriate transitional set setting where they can get expert rehabilitation care. I can't, for the life of me, I mean, this is such a direct question which runs contrary to their expressed opposition they're, to this proposal. They're calling it warehousing. They're calling that site mothballed. They obviously don't like it. Answer. And so the actual solution being proposed by Humber River that we're looking at they oppose, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. 
Sick Kids Hospital reached a high capacity last winter of 107 per cent of its acute care beds. Its mental health unit reached an astonishing 136 per cent capacity, over capacity at the exact same time. Again, the minister has known about this crisis for years. What is the minister's plan to make sure that no sick child admitted to sick kids will ever feel the burden of this government neglect of our hospital? When will he stop risking the health and lives of those little sick children just to balance the bottom line? Well, you know, Mr. Speaker, I'm so disappointed once again in the NDP rhetoric. The, the fact that that members, member is suggesting that Ontarians cannot trust the hospital for sick children with the hundreds, if not thousands, of frontline health care workers, the volunteers, the administrators who are working day in and day out to provide world-class health care for the youngest yeah. members of our society. And to suggest that, that somehow I'm, Mr. Speaker, that this government or me as minister, that I'm putting those lives at risk is unbearable for me. But it's, it's in line with the rhetoric that they're increasingly using, which is creating fear mongering. And the, 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 the fact that they addressed our long, -ter long term care system as being in chaos. The fact that they're talking Answer. about mothballing of individuals and facilities, the fact that they're opposing every effort that we're making to address the challenges that we face, I find unconscionable. Thank you. Uncon Final supplementary. Those little six children get very good care once they are admitted, Speaker, yes. but this is what the issue is all about. The Premier is the minister is refusing to listen to the opposition. He has refused to listen to the Ontario Hospital Association. He says that he cares about the fact, but he's been presented with the fact, Speaker, time and time again in this House and by the people of Ontario, only to continue to deny that there is a real crisis of overcapacity in our hospital. What will it take for this minister to take some real action, to take some decisive action, and to help Ontario families throughout our province who need hospital care and end up admitted into a hallway? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I have lived and worked in many countries in the health care systems, and I know that we have one of the best health care systems in the entire world, and it's here in this province, Mr. Speaker. I know that that party has given up on our health care system. I know that that party is fear-mongering for partisan political reasons. We're not going to stand for that. We're going to defend the health care system. We're going to defend the doctors and the nurses and the personal support workers and the thousands upon thousands that are working every day to provide that highest quality care. We have one of the best cancer care programs in the entire world, bar none. We have one of the best hospitals down the road in sick kids' hospitals. If you can continue to disparage our hospital system like the way you are, I'm going to continue sure. to defend it. I believe in it. I love the health care system that we have in this province, and we have to defend it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Dufferin Calvary. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. In July, your government gave $1.5 million to support the Carrot Rewards Act. The minister's announcement described Carrot Rewards as, quote, an innovative health promotion mobile phone app the rewards users for being active, eating healthy, and quitting smoking, with the goal of reducing the risk of chronic diseases. Now Carrot Rewards is encouraging users to check their credit score. Can the minister explain what credit scores have to do with reducing chronic diseases? Wow. Thank you. Minister Well, it seems to be the trend this morning, Mr. Speaker. I can't believe it seems we've you know, the opposition has reached new depths in twisting information and vilifying Canadian companies in the interest of scoring cheap political points, Mr. Speaker. I believe it's critical that we support Ontarians by encouraging people to make healthy and active lifestyle choices. That's why we partnered with Carrot Rewards. It's an innovative health promotion mobile phone application rewarding users for being active eating healthy and quitting smoking. We invested care award in care I think that's enough. Finish please.
Mr. Speaker, Carrot has absolutely no affiliation with Equifax, and if she or her staff had done their research, she would understand that. This, Mr. Speaker, is the PC party of 2017, and Mr. Speaker, 14 years in yes, opposition sir. has not been kind. You say it, please. You say it, please. Uh, I'd like to remind members, particularly those that have already been reminded, that we're in warnings. Supplementary. The arrogance of this government is beyond the pale. You are throwing away $1.5 million, and you call me political points? Unbelievable. To the minister, Speaker. Care Rewards contracted Borwell. Follow the dots, Minister. A company partnered with Equifax to check Care Reward users' credit scores. Borwell admitted in September that the Equifax breach could, quote, put you at risk of identity theft. The government gave Carrot Insights $1.5 million, but did not do their due diligence to ensure the money was, in fact, used to encourage healthy living. Care Rewards is still directing Ontarians today Question. to a service using Equifax during what is reported to be the largest breach of social insurance numbers in North America. Thank you. What steps has the minister taken to ensure that the Thank personal you. information of Care Reward youth? Here, here. Thank you. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, Carrot no more has a relationship with, with Equifax than CIBC has a relationship with Equifax, Mr. Speaker, let alone it's a third party twice removed. So I think members of this House would all. My lenience is exhausted. The member from Dufferin Caledon is warned. Finish, please. Thank you. So, Carrot Rewards was actually launched in partnership with the Harper federal government in July of 2015, when Rona Ambrose was Minister of Health. Carrot worked for the federal government, worked with them for an entire year before they signed its contract in January, when Patrick Brown was still a federal member. In fact, the five million dollars was provided by the Conservative federal government to Carrot Rewards. So, Mr. Speaker, this had its genesis with the federal Conservative government, but of course the member opposite didn't look into any of that before trying to attack a good Canadian success story without merit. The Progressive yes, Conservative Party of Bill Davis is long since gone. Thank you. I can't see it. You see it, please? You see it, please? You won't know when I'm going to say so, and if you had to said it one more sentence after I had started, you would have been warned. The minister knows better. We refer to anybody in this place to their title or their writing. We must elevate our debate. New question, the member from London, Fanshawe. My question is to the Acting Premier. Judy Cogden of London waited more than a year for her knee surgery, and now she's waiting even longer in pain for her hip surgery replacement. Her surgery date last month was cancelled due to the lack of funding, and now Judy, like so many Londoners, will wait two long years for the surgery she desperately needs. London, Strathroy and Stratford have the some of the longest wait times in Ontario for hip and knee surgeries. And that's just not me saying that. The head of the Lynn says, quote, our, time, our wait times are some of the worst in this province. When will this government stop squeezing our hospitals and start making sure that patients like Judy don't have to wait years for surgery that they need now? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Health, Long-Term Care. Mr. Health, Long-Term Care. Mr. Speaker, since uh, we came into office, our government has invested over almost $2 billion wow. 
for more than 3 million additional procedures to help reduce wait times. In fact, as a result of that, the Wait Time Alliance report card uh, continues to give Ontario straight A's in five key service areas, including hip replacement surgery and knee replacement surgery. Straight A's, Mr. Speaker. Now, we know that there is variation across the province, and that's one of the reasons why this past summer we made available publicly to both health care providers and patients and Ontarians information about wait times for a whole set of procedures publicly available so individuals can see, for example, which hospitals have long, longer wait times, which hospitals have shorter wait times, and they can work with their health care provider and to make a decision that suits their particular and unique needs. We know that we need to continue to invest in the supplementary. I'll talk about those you. investments in this budget. Supplementary. The crisis in health care in London is a direct result of years of hospital cuts by the Conservatives and the Liberals. Since 2013, <laughs> London Health Sciences has been forced to cut $141 million, and at least 488 full-time equivalent jobs have been cut. That is the Premier's legacy in London. Now we have the longest wait time in surgeries. Our hospitals are overcrowded and pleading for dozens of beds, of new beds. And the acting Premier just sits there and makes excuses instead of standing up in health care in her own city. When will this government stop cutting health care like the Conservatives and start fixing the damages the Liberals have done to hospitals across southwestern Ontario? Mr. Speaker, as part of the budget, we uh, announced an additional $50 million to improve access and wait times for hospital services, including specifically knee and hip surgery. In the Southwest Lynn, this included an additional half million dollars for more hip and knee replacement surgeries. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, it's important that Ontarians understand the situation in the province, that according to data from CHI-HI, Ontario continues to beat the national targets for hip and knee surgery wait times, and also compared to other jurisdictions, uh, it's 121 days across the OECD, 86 days in Canada, 75 days wait in the UK, and only 70 days in Ontario. So the wait times similarly for knee replacements in Ontario are half the average of what it is in the OECD. That's we absolutely have more work to do. That's precisely why we made the wait time hip and knee investments in this year's thank budget. Thank you. Yep. question the member from Beaches East Shore. Well, thank you, Speaker, and my question is to the Minister of Finance. In 2010, Speaker, this government promised to eliminate the deficit and balance the budget by 2017-18. And this was not very long after the 08-09 recession, which had very extremely negative impacts on countries around the world. And Ontario, of course, Speaker, was not immune. However, rather than slash the programs and services upon which Ontario families rely in order to eliminate the deficit, I am very proud of the fact that our government chose to build Ontario up. The investments that we have made in transit, schools, hospitals, education have led people to choose Ontario as their home now more than ever. And I, for one, am happy to see that there are more supports for municipalities. Ontario cities and towns are now receiving four times the level of support they got in 2003, more than four Question. billion in supports. So, Speaker, can the minister remind the House how, on this side of the House, we've been able to invest in the people of Ontario for 14 years without taking the slashing Thank and you. cutting as they would do on that side of that. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. For the past 14 years, our government has taken a balanced approach to keeping Ontario at the forefront of a global economy. We manage our expenses and transform how we deliver public services, making them more efficient and more effective. This is the type of financial responsibility that the opposition doesn't understand, Mr. Speaker. By investing in progressive policies, we're stimulating growth in our economy, making historic infrastructure investments, putting $20 billion into hospitals, $16 billion into schools, free tuition for our students, and free farmer care for our young people. Meanwhile, our program expense GDP is lean and lower than pre-recession levels. Yeah. Let me remind you, Mr. Speaker, under the previous PC government, Ontario taxpayers were paying 15 cents for every dollar earned just to service the debt. Yeah. Now in Ontario, we're paying only 8.4 cents, and next year it'll be even lower. We've eliminated the deficit, we've balanced the budget, and that means more money to invest in health care, education, you. and other public services yeah. that matter. Thank you. 
Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and back to the Minister of Finance. Because if you listen, Speaker, to what the people, what the opposition are saying, they want people to believe that we've made no advancements over the last 14 years. They would like people to believe that we have had no improvements in businesses and no invest investments in industries like the tech sector and the STEM sector. They would want you to believe. Too late. Member from Nipissing is warned. All in case the member needs a reminder, we're in warnings. Thank you, Speaker. Um, they would want us to believe that Ontarians have not been working hard to grow this economy into one of the strongest in Canada and all of North America. And it's hard to rectify that with what the Minister of Finance has just spoken about. How, under Liberal leadership, we have dug Ontario out of the recession. How, because of this, we are now able to make very progressive investments in new policy that will attract foreign investment. So, Speaker, can the Minister tell us about the great progress that this side of the House has made over the last 14 Question. years to make Ontario the best place to create and grow jobs? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Minister of Economic Growth and Development, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I am very proud to stand up today to say that we've worked tirelessly with our business community and Ontario workers to build Ontario up, Mr. Speaker, and to turn our economy into one of the strongest in Canada and North America. Yes, we've weathered that, that one of the worst recessions we've seen in recent memory. Since then, we've added 760,000 net new jobs. Since then, Mr. Speaker, and for the last three years, we've been leading the G7 in growth. Since then, Mr. Speaker, we've brought our unemployment rate down to 5.7 per cent, the lowest in 16 years. Since then, Mr. Speaker, we've invested $3 billion in partnerships with businesses, leveraging $27 billion in private sector investment, supporting 170,000 jobs. And just as importantly, Mr. Speaker, we're now poised to lead in the new global economy. Mr. Speaker, we've transformed our economy. We're heading Thank in you. the right direction. Thank you. New question, the member from the P and Politics. Speaker, my question is to the President of the Treasury Board. Uh, the opioid crisis has been gripping the province for about a year now. Cities like Toronto, Ottawa, London and Kitchener are not immune to the spread of deadly opiates that uh, have claimed the lives of 865 Ontarians in 2016. The best way to prevent Ontarians, particularly the youth in our province, from taking potentially deadly drugs laced with fentanyl is through greater awareness and better education. Given the government uh, bulk media buy or its advertising budget, which has grown in the last year from $25 million to $56 million, oh. will the government commit to dedicating 10 per cent of that to the public fight against opioids? Thank you. President, President Bork. Minister of Health. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I genuinely appreciate the question, and I think that uh, we share the same uh, assessment uh, that we have a public health crisis, a public health emergency with regards to opioids uh, in this province and in this country, uh, and we need to do uh, everything we can, including education and awareness. Uh, it is an important tool. It's one of those touch points. It's not the only one. Uh, but it is an important touch point where we can alert people to the dangers and the risks inherent to both licit and illicit drug use, uh, and particularly, as the member opposite has said, with regards to young persons. Uh, so this, uh, the education and awareness component of the opioid crisis is an aspect of our response that we've been working on for quite some time. Uh, in fact, we're working closely across ministries, education, higher education, for example, and others, uh, to make Answer. sure uh, as we roll out this aspect of our efforts to fight the epidemic, that it is also having that intended impact. Thank, Thank you. you. Supplementary. Much to the Minister of Health, but I'll go back to the President of the Treasury Board. The government spent $5.7 million on ORPP ads after the program was scrapped or during the program scrapping. Um, you're also slated to spend at least $5.5 million on the Fair Hydro Plan that the government, uh, the auditor, called a pat on the back. I'm asking basically for $5.6 million to be dedicated to opioid awareness in a public health and safety campaign pain that could save lives. Later today, the family of Nick Cody will join me at Queen's Park to introduce Nick's law. Nick died of a drug overdose after fighting addiction, and his parents, Steve and Natalie, believe we need a province-wide awareness campaign. More money for awareness is just one more tool in the toolkit in the opioid crisis, but I believe it is a very important one. 
Will the government commit at least $5 million into advertising and education campaign to tell Ontarians about these deadly drugs? Thank you. Can you say the case? Can you say the case? Thank you. Minister? Well, Mr. Speaker, again, I, I share the member opposite's uh, concern. Uh, and the objective as well, in terms of the, that, that, that one component, education awareness. Member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke is warned. Carry on, please. So we need to be sure that we're reaching uh, young persons in school, in colleges and universities, that we have a campaign that reaches people that uh, go to nightclubs and bars, for example, where they may come into contact with tainted drugs. The, the problem that we're facing is an increasing amount of fentanyl that many, if not most, individuals that consume drugs uh, are completely unaware of its existence and the risks inherent in that. We're funding safe inject injection sites, including in uh, the members' uh, city of Ottawa. We're funding uh, test strips so you can test for the presence of fentanyl. We just released $21 million out of nearly $300 million investment over a three-year period Answer. to fight the crisis, $21 million to go specifically to harm reduction workers on the front line so they have the tools that they need as well. Thank you. New question. The member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, Ontario families and education advocates were shocked to discover that this government is welcoming U.S. Education Secretary Betsy DeVos to Ontario. DeVos is an outspoken proponent of voucher programs that divert public dollars to private schools and undermine a strong publicly funded education system. With a $15 billion backlog in school maintenance and repair, with rising violence in Ontario schools, with chronic underfunding of special education, why is this government giving a platform to someone who believes that government should be spending less, not more, on public education? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Speaker, I, I am so proud of our education system in Ontario. We have actually transformed education over the last 14 years. Our graduation rate has gone from a, a, a shameful 68 per cent to over 86 per cent. Speaker. It is a remarkable turnaround. The more we can spread the word about what has happened in education in Ontario, the better. I actually think that Secretary DeVos has a lot to learn from the Ontario experience. I welcome the opportunity to be able to educate her about how public education can work and can be strong and can benefit students, all students. I think there is a lot to learn, and I'm glad that she is actually taking the opportunity to learn about our Answer. education miracle. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Supplementary. Again, to the Acting Premier, it's not just DeVos's position on school choice and privatization that has people worried. She rolled back rules on gender-neutral washrooms in schools and watered down college policies on handling sexual assault. Public education advocates strongly denounce her views. The president of the Ontario Teachers' Federation wants DeVos to keep her backward ideas out of Ontario. Why won't this Liberal government listen to teachers? and take a strong stand against privatization, against trans exclusion, against gender-based violence, and retract its invitation to allow DeVos to tour Ontario schools. Thank you. <coughs> you see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Speaker, you know, Speaker, um, this is a disappointing question coming from the uh, the NDP because when it comes to public education, Ontario has one of the best public leader. education systems in the entire world, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to focusing on student yeah. achievement and equity, Ontario has one of the best public education systems in the entire okay. world, okay. Mr. Speaker.
finish, please? If Secretary DeVos wants to learn about public education, there is no better place in the world to come than to Ontario to learn about public education and how we are serving the needs of Ontario's 2 million students. 95% of students in Ontario attend our public education system because Answer. we have an excellent system and we are proud to tell the Secretary and anyone else who wants to listen. Again, my patience. Member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek, is warned. And I think Windsor West is looking. I'm not sure. New question, the member from Barry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Over the last 14 years, our government has worked hard to improve the quality of our publicly funded education system. Absolutely. Yes. I also know that as a teacher and a union leader that we inherited a system that was severely underfunded and in disrepair. However, our government has made historic investments and we continue to build on our proven track record of supporting student success. I know that we have made many accomplishments during this time and that we have been recognized by the international community for our excellence in education. Yes. We always want to make sure that our young people are equipped with the supports they need to reach their full potential, both inside and outside of the classroom. Mr. Speaker, Question. through you to the minister, after 14 years of progress, has our government improved the quality of education? How has our government improved the Thank quality you. of education? The member from Niagara, West Glanbrook, is warned. And it doesn't matter where you hide, I'll still find you. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Barrie for this question. I know how passionate she is about Ontario's public education system. And Mr. Speaker, we are starting right where it belongs, with the investments in our classroom. After 14 years, we have increased education funding in this province by 66 per cent to more than $23 billion each year. Our historic investments in education are paying off. Contributing to the high school graduation rate of, Mr. Speaker, a historic high, 86.5 per cent, up from 68 per cent in 2004. Over 14 years, we've invested more than $17 billion in school infrastructure, 820 new schools, and more than 800 additions and renovations, which is part of our plan to create jobs and grow our economy. Let's talk about full-day kindergarten, Thank you. Mr. Yes. Speaker. Later. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the response. I know just how enthusiastic parents were when sending their children off to school this fall, yes, and are. it's clear just how much families value Ontario's publicly funded education system. Yeah, yeah. Thanks to our supports and investments, our students consistently rank amongst the best in national and international student achievement outcomes. That's right. Over the last 14 years, our plan for our education system is clear. We are committed to supporting student achievement, equity, and well-being for all students in Ontario. We've also heard that we are collaborating with education partners to prioritize student success and well-being. Minister, can you please tell us more about our plan to pave pathways to success for all students and to support all Question. education workers within our publicly funded education system? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I want to say thank you again to the member from Barrie. And as she well knows, the excellence in our education system begins with our excellent teachers and education workers across this province, Mr. Speaker, who show up each and every single day on behalf of all of our students. And I just want to say thank you to them. Mr. Speaker, we have invested in our system of education because we know this is the best investment we can make in the skills and in the talents of our students, Mr. Speaker. We've 
introduce new programs to prepare, prepare students for the workplace I and for enter. life I after graduation. The Minister of Agriculture is talking about our specialist high skills major program, including our agriculture program. And these specialist high skills major programs, Mr. Speaker, are having extraordinary impact on our students. But we're not stopping there, Mr. Speaker. Answer. We've invested an additional $190 million over three years to create 40,000 more work-related integrated programs 40, for students, Thank giving you. them the experience that they need. Thank you. Your question, the member from Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I have a question for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. This past Friday, Saturday and Sunday, Ontario celebrated Ontario's Culture Days for 2017. Beginning last, for the last Friday of September, September, the annual Cultural Days Weekend features hands-on, behind-the-scenes, community-engaged activities inviting the public to contribute to arts and culture across Canada. This year, the Ontario Cultural Days fell on the important Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur, unfortunately, and this means that many in Thornhill and the Jewish community across Ontario were unable to participate. Um, as, you know, and I'm not talking about just attending. I'm talking like actually participating in the events that foster engagement and support for the diverse arts and culture community in Ontario. And I'm just wondering if the minister can explain why there isn't a plan in place to accommodate special days like Yom Kippur. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for the question, and uh, I know how important her faith is to her, Speaker, and in, in, uh, in recognition of that, I want to um, say how much I respect her question. I do want to point out, Speaker, though, that Culture Days, which we celebrate right across Ontario, encompass about 200 cultures in Ontario, and with a busy calendar season every year, sometimes it's difficult to choose a day that doesn't affect a particular faith and a particular religion. I will take this back to my officials, having had the question now from the honourable member and, and see what we can do to avoid such duplications in the future. But I know that she appreciates that there are hundreds of cultures across Ontario and that sometimes, again, it's difficult to schedule these kinds of events and celebrations, given that there's one almost every weekend, on days that don't impact a particular culture or faith. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again to the minister. And I just want to read from a message from Ontario Premier Kathleen Wynne on Yom Kippur, where she said just last week that Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is the holiest day in the Jewish calendar. Now, I can understand that everybody here can appreciate that there are a lot of Jewish holidays, and uh, it's, it's a never-ending cycle of holidays in the Jewish community. But Yom Kippur is a little bit different. It is the holiest day. We don't need the Premier to tell the community that, um, but maybe but maybe the Premier's words need to ring into some of the ministry staff to understand that. Uh, we have artists like we lost Leonard Cohen this year, Eugene Levy is a, a famous uh, Canadian actor, even Drake was bar mitzvahed, Mr. Speaker. And I would just like to see a little bit of recognition that for the high holidays of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, that events like the Culture uh, Days are, can accommodate those uh, special days. Thank, thank you. you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Again, I uh, thank the member opposite for the question. You know, Speaker, I want to take this opportunity to wish the Jewish community in Ontario and beyond our very best wishes for the high holiday season, which, of course, as the member opposite has just mentioned, is just behind us now. Having uh, Jewish members in my own family, Speaker, I'm very proud to, as we all are, of our Jewish community here in Ontario. There are enormous accomplishments. In fact, Speaker, in the arts and culture sector, there are many artists who are Jewish. So I want to just respond by saying again that we will look at the calendar speaker, but I also know that the member opposite appreciates the diverse nature of our province. And when it comes to Kathleen Wynne and her support for the arts and culture sector and her support for the various faiths in this province, nobody can question that commitment, yes. Mr. Speaker, absolutely. because she is absolutely committed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Answer. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question? The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Acting Premier. In 2015, Toronto was rocked by the death of Andrew Loku, a 45-year-old black man in mental health distress in an incident with police. Rightly, a coroner's inquest was called, and earlier this year, that inquest made 39 recommendations that would give the police the training and tools 
They need to de-escalate situations with racialized populations and those who need to be heard and helped so that incidents such as the death of Andrew Loku may never happen again. Today, I'm joined by a group of concerned mental health professionals on the front lines of this issue who are calling on this Liberal government to act on the coroner's inquest recommendations. My question, question. when will the Premier implement the local inquest recommendations? Thank you. <laughs> you see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Deputy Premier. To the uh, Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, the member for his uh, questions. And first, I want to express my sincere condolences uh, to the friends and the family of Andrew Loku. I know that uh, police officers are increasingly interacting with vulnerable individuals, often with complex mental health issues, Mr. Speaker, and this is why we need to modernize the police service training. Police officers need the necessary tools to defuse crisis situations and protect both themselves and their communities. Through our strategy for a safer Ontario, we will promote a collaborative partnership between police, the public, and other sectors such as education, health care, and social. And this will improve interaction between police and our vulnerable Ontarians. Mr. Thank you. <clears throat> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And back to the Acting Premier. Notwithstanding those assurances, the reality is that it has been two years since the tragic death of Mr. Loku. The jury's in, and those recommendations have yet to be implemented. The time of talk and good intentions is over. The people of this province don't need another coroner's inquest gathering dust on someone's desk. When? When will this Liberal government act to implement the coroner's inquest recommendations into the death of Andrew Loku? Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, our government is very committed uh, to make sure that people with mental health issues get access to the service they need, Mr. Speaker. And through the strategy for Safer Ontario, we will be improving the de-escalation training for all new recruits and existing officers across the province. Incorporating use of force and de-escalation into our upcoming legislation to ensure police can fully respond to individuals in crisis. We will establish the most appropriate model for police interaction with persons who are in crisis, Mr. Speaker. My ministry is also working uh, very hard and, and diligently with the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care to provide people with mental health issues with the right care in the right place at the right time. And, Mr. Speaker, we uh, will be Answer. bringing legislation this fall. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. New question, the member from Merci. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Infrastructure. I'd like to thank uh, Minister Chiarelli and the Premier for joining me in my riding of Etobicoke North for the latest and greatest infrastructure development, the $400 million expansion of Etobicoke General Hospital. <laughs> 14 years of dedicated Liberal leadership such as this speaker has resulted in the largest infrastructure renewal in Ontario's history. Under the leadership of this government, whether it's hospitals, schools, public transit projects across Ontario, and of course these were precisely the projects ignored egregiously by both the PC and the NDP governments. At the heart of our $190 billion 13-year plan is a commitment to creating better lives for the people of Ontario. In Etobicoke North, whether it's communities, schools, hospital, transport infrastructure, there are developments all around Question. the riding. But the opposition has uh, opposed us every step of the way. Speaker, could the minister please elaborate on Ontario's current infrastructure developments? Thank you. Thank you. Minister, uh, Speaker, minister I thank the member for the question. Speaker, our government invests an average of $12 billion per year on infrastructure, on track for $20 billion next year. In their last year in power, the Tories spent $1.9 billion. They killed transit projects and let social infrastructure rot. Yep. Our Liberal government has been building Ontario up for 14 years. We've invested $280 million in broadband, connecting tens of thousands to high-speed internet. We've carried out 100 major hospital and children's treatment centres. 
with 35 more underway. We were the first Ontario government to invest $100 million in rural natural gas expansion. We tripled to $300 million the annual Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund for smaller communities. Answer. And we are funding nearly 1,400 clean water and wastewater projects. Speaker, there is no debate to be had. Of all the parties represented in this House, only Thank ours you. has delivered on infrastructure. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Minister, for the flurry of developments in your leadership. I know that the investments that we've made over the past 14 years in every corner of this province will benefit today's generation, but these will also lay the foundation for a fair and prosperous Ontario for our kids and grandkids. Speaker, whether we're making infrastructure investments in health care, in education, in transportation, these are, of course, a top priority for the community that I represent in Etobicoke North. From rapid transit to GO Regional Express Rail, these new transit options, as an example, will allow people in my community of Etobicoke North to get to work or school or, and back and forth from home faster than ever before. Speaker, as an example, we have a $1.2 billion Finch LRT custom designed with eight stops right in Question. Etobicoke North. I'd like to ask, Speaker, would the minister please provide more information on what our government continues to do to reverse the chronic underinvestment, the legacy Thank of you. the government's opposite? Minister of Transportation. Thank you Delighted to have a chance to answer the uh, member from Etobicoke North's question. He is absolutely correct, Speaker. Since 2003, we have gotten a lot done. So, for example, the Eglinton Crosstown LRT, which will open up in 2021, Speaker, when you think about that, it will be more than 20 years since the Conservative Party killed and filled the Eglinton subway, Speaker. We also know that when the Conservatives were last in government, Speaker, they invested between 10 to 15 times less uh, per year than we have than uh, in GO Transit and other rapid transit projects, Speaker. And of course, an oldie but a goodie, Speaker, we can never forget that Mike Harris and the Conservatives sold Highway 407, Speaker. Now, let's take a look at what our Liberal government's done over the last 14 years. We've extended the GO Rail network by nearly 90 kilometers. The Toronto York Spadina subway extension is merely weeks away from opening, Speaker, and we have already opened the first phase Answer. of the publicly owned Highway 407 that'll be going out to the 11535 in no time, Speaker. Our record is clear, and Thank so you. is the Conservative record. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Lampton, Kent, Middlesex. To the Acting Premier. Canada's Premiers are gathered in Ottawa today with Finance Minister Bill Morneau to discuss the Liberal proposal to raise taxes on small businesses. We already know that Premiers from across Canada are standing up for their small businesses and family farms, but so far, Ontario has refused to condemn the action of their federal cousins. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier be on the side of our small businesses and family farms or Justin Trudeau's? Thank you. Uh, to, the, to the Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the federal government, as everyone knows, has proposed changes to close loopholes used by consulting firms and professionals. Yep. Um, we need to understand the implication of these changes to small business, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that Ontario continues to grow and thrive. Regardless of the federal government's decisions, we will continue to take action to support growth of small business in Ontario. We have already lowered, Mr. Speaker, business corporate tax rates from 5.5% in 2009 to 4.5%. We've eliminated capital tax, Mr. Speaker, lowering overall tax rates. We've accelerated capital cost allowance to enable them to invest. And, Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to work with our small business community to ensure that they are protected and that whatever the federal government does, we will continue to support small business and the business community. We have 5.6% of unemployment, and there's more investment in Ontario than anywhere else in Canada because of the efforts that we continue to make. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have a deferred vote on a motion for closure, a motion for second reading of Bill 154, an act to cut unnecessary red tape by enacting one new act and making various amendments and repeals. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
members, please take your seats. All members, please take your seats. On September 25th, 2017, Mr. Dugat moved second reading of Bill 154, an act to cut unnecessary red tape by enacting one new act and making various amendments and repeals. Mr. Chan has moved that the question be now put. All those in favor of Mr. Chan's motion, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Dalduca. Mr. Dalduca. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Mr. Charles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bartonetti. Mr. Bartonetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow, Madame Lalonde, Madame Lalonde, Mr. Cadre, Mr. Cadre, Mr. Dixon, Mr. Dixon, Mrs. Manga, Mrs. Manga, Mr. Crack, Mr. Crack, Mr. Dahmerla, Mr. Dahmerla, Mrs. McGarry, Mrs. McGarry, Mr. Morrow, Mr. Morrow, Mrs. Jassy, Mrs. Jassy, Mr. Zimmer, Mr. Zimmer, Mrs. Albanese, Mrs. Albanese, Mr. McMahon, Mr. McMahon, Mr. Nidu Harris, Mr. Nidu Harris, Mr. Milchin, Mr. Milchin, Ms. Wong, Ms. Wong, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Baker, Mr. Baker, Mr. Dong, Mr. Dong, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Koala, Ms. Koala, Ms. Molly, Ms. Molly, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Martin, Mr. Potts, Mr. Potts, Mr. Rinaldi, Mr. Rinaldi, Mr. Neal, Mr. Neal, Madame de Rosier, Madame de Rosier. All those opposed, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Marteau. Mr. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nadishai. Mr. Nadishai. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Jellina. Madame Jellina. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 52, the nays are 43. The ayes being 52, the nays being 43, I declare the motion carried. Mr. Dugan has moved second reading of Bill 154, an act to cut unnecessary red tape by enacting one, uh, one new act and making various amendments and repeals. Is the pleasure of the House the motion carry? I heard a no. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call in the members. This will be a five minute bell. Mr. Dugan has moved second reading of Bill 154, an act to cut unnecessary red tape by enacting a new uh, one new act and making various amendments and repeals. All those in favor, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Delduca. Mr. Delduca. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Chan. Mr. 
Mr. Chan, Mr. Moridi, Mr. Moridi, Mr. Coteau, Mr. Coteau, Ms. Hunter, Ms. Hunter, Mr. Leo, Mr. Leo, Mr. Flynn, Ms. Mr. Flynn, Mr. Tebow, Mr. Tebow, Madame Milan, Madame Milan, Mr. Cadre, Mr. Cadre, Mr. Mr. Dixon, Mr. Dixon, Mrs. Manga, Mrs. Manga, Mr. Crack, Mr. Crack, Mr. Domerle, Mr. Domerle, Mr. McGarry, Mrs. McGarry, Mr. Morrow, Mr. Morrow, Mr. Jassik, Mr. Jassik, Mr. Zimmer, Mr. Zimmer, Mrs. Albanese, Mrs. Albanese, Mr. McMahon, Mrs. McMahon, Mr. Nidu Harris, Mr. Nidu Harris, Mr. Milchin, Mr. Milchin, Mr. Wong, Ms. Wall, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Baker, Mr. Baker, Mr. Dong, Mr. Dong, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Koala, Ms. Koala, Ms. Molly, Ms. Molly, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Martin, Mr. Potts, Mr. Potts, Mr. Ronaldi, Mr. Ronaldi, Mr. Renil, Mr. Renil, Madame de Rosier, Madame de Rosier. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Harnett. Mr. Harnett. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Monroe. Mr. Monroe. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Marteau. Mr. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Spike. Mr. Spike. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Hamil Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nadishai. Mr. Nadishai. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jalina. Madame Jalina. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. You're recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 95, the nays are zero. The ayes being 95 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Shall the bill re be referred for third reading, Minister of Economic Development and Growth? Shall so the bill re be referred to the Standing Committee on Justice Policy, Mr. Speaker? So ordered. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.